First, Dr. Teresa Far Brown, we would like to thank you for your generosity of time to sit down with us. And before we even ask you any question, we want you to know how proud and how excited we are that you sit in the bandy chair of homiletics at Emory and that you are in the most prestigious chair and you are the senior homiletician in the country. So we're honored that you're here with us. And thank you. Thankful and so grateful. Thank you. So uh, we know who Dr. Teresa Fry Brown is, uh, but there may be some folks that are part of our viewing audience who do not know you. Tell us about yourself. How far back do you want me to go? I want you to go all the way back. All right. Uh, I'm Billy and Naomi's child from Independence, Missouri. I uh, grew up Baptist and um, 1994 became a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, second oldest of seven children, um, married and now widowed and have a daughter, and um, have been singing or talking about God for 66 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, where are the beginnings of the inklings of a call? The inklings of the call, I think, came when I was a child. Um, my grandparents were big in the Baptist church in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so I was drugged to everything on Sunday and Wednesday and Thursday and didn't know normal people, didn't go to church every day. And um, was always asked to be up front to say a speech. I did my first solo when I was five. Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. Uh, <laughs> with little ashy legs and everything and little petticoats. and. Um, just was from the beginning of my life uh, given this deep foundation of faith. Mm -hmm. And whenever God asks you to do something, you do it, regardless of what anybody else says. And so I did all the speeches, the Easter speeches, all these other kinds of things. And then I was a soloist in a choir. And my mother said that whenever I began to sing, before I sing, I would say something. And so they didn't call it preaching because women weren't supposed to preach when I was in Missouri. And uh, from that, uh, always became, received support from my family on whatever I was doing. And so when my mother was 51, she had the beginnings of what was Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to go with my then uh, two month old daughter to Kansas City to uh, have her uh, admitted to a facility. And my grandmother went with me and while I was on the plane, I was having this conversation in my head with God about you know, everything that was going on. And uh, in this conversation at some point, it wasn't a deep voice or anything like that. Um, it was, I need you to do more. And I thought, well, what more? I'm Sunday school teacher, I'm choir director, I, you know, I slept coffee, I do everything. What more can I possibly do? And God said, I need you to do more. And I was thinking, well, what more? And then, then in, our, in my head, it was, I need you to teach, preach, and write. So I was immediately just kind of taken back because I thought, no, men preach because that's what I was taught. The teaching and writing I have no problem with, but then it was very emphatic, teach, preach, and write. So when I returned uh, from all my duties in Kansas City and went back to Denver uh, to talk to my father in ministry, Jesse Langston Boyd, he said, uh, and my then husband, was, had just entered ministry, he said, maybe you're getting mixed up and you're answering Roger's call. And I said, no, Roger wasn't on the airplane. <laughs> it's not Roger's call. And then he said, well, I don't know what to do because I've never had a woman tell me that she's supposed to preach. Go away and pray about it. Mm. So for a year I was told to go away and pray. Every time I showed up, he would say, go pray about it. So at the end of the year, I marked it on the calendar because I'm anal that way, right? And I said, Reverend Boyd, it didn't go away. And he said, I don't know how we're going to do this, but let's go ahead and work on it. And he said, then I need you to know that if we go through with this process, uh, people are going to think that you are answering Roger's call. People are going to think that you want to abandon motherhood. People are going to think that you are just want to sleep with I'm trying to edit my language now, mm -hmm. speaking of rhetoric. <laughs> people, people are going to think that you just want to sleep with preachers or people are gonna think you're lesbian and you want to do what men do. And I said, God didn't say any of that stuff to me. So we need to go forward with this. And it was bruising. It was absolutely bruising. And all the things that he said came to pass uh, from women and men in the church. And so I was the only one in my ordination class. I was the only woman there. 
and then another woman came. So in the, at that time, in the 140 some year history of, of Shorter Amy Church, I was the first woman and the first woman to come into ministry in my particular uh, section of the country. So it was, it was God speaking to, I don't know why this is messing with me. <laughs> it was God speaking to me even above the noise of an airplane. Uh, and, and the voice never went away. And, and even though the church said that the call to, you had a call to preach, I understood that God put the other two things there. So when I'm in the board of examiners in the AME church, African Methodist Episcopal church, they said, so you're going to preach and pastor. I said, that's not what God told me to do. So as I say to my students now, there's a consequence for doing what God tells you to do and not what a board tells you to do. And so uh, that's been my call all the way along was to teach, preach and write. And God has been faithful because that's what I do is teach, preach and write now 35 years later. Um, so, yeah, that's where the call emanated. It was that, uh, and, and, I, and I know in studying that often people answer the call when they've gone through some life changing kind of situation that brings their mortality before them. Mm -hmm. I think it was always with me. And I remember talking to my grandfather, who was a chairperson of, uh, he was the chairman of Missouri Layman at that time at the Progressive Baptist Church. And I said, Daddy Lyman, um, I don't want you to be upset, but I have this call to preach. So he started talking about women in the family who had been evangelists. Mm. And he said, baby, if God told you to do it, it's okay. Mm. And so in my family, uh, because I guess they wanted to protect me because I was the, the second oldest grandchild, um, all the men in my family supported everything that I did. Mm -hmm. It was my, I had two aunts that thought that I was going to cause trouble, that never to one till the day she died, never recognized that I was a preacher. Mm -hmm. But the men always said, uh, and my brothers always say, well, you know, whatever you say you're going to do, you're going to do, so we're going to support you in it. So they call me the Rev, so <laughs> they've always supported me. Tell me about the women evangelists in your family that uh, I have an aunt, I had an aunt that was my grandmother's sister actually, that I did not know pastored a church in Holden, Missouri for 35 years and no one in the family ever talked about it. Mm. Uh, when I was teaching at Central Missouri State University, which is now the University of Central Missouri, uh, and Thelma came to a Baptist church when I was singing because I was in this concert, she wanted to hear me, and she would sit on the front row, but they never recognized her. And it wasn't until maybe my 10th year in that someone said something about Aunt Thelma's church. So I couldn't understand why they were supporting me, but they didn't even articulate that this is what she'd done. And she'd, she was at that church for 40 years. Wow. wow. Um, one of my grandfather's aunts was a traveling evangelist, a la Jarena Lee. So she, could, she wasn't at a church, but she just traveled around in Missouri, Southern Missouri, holding prayer meetings and preaching in people's houses and things of that nature. So it wasn't part of the family script until I said, this is what God told me to do. Mm. So it was, it was a very interesting kind of thing. So I don't know where all that, why we kept it, well, I do know why we kept it a secret because women weren't supposed to do that. Right. And they were again, castigated and covered up and everything else, but they raised me to, uh, do whatever, uh, you know, Zora Neale Hurston talks about her mother said to jump at the sun, that you may not reach the sun, but at least you tried. That's how they raised me. And I was raised with lots of boys who uh, <laughs> taught me to fight and taught me to stand up for what I needed and to still be able to be feminine and be me totally. And so that helped me, I think, in answering the call, but also in navigating uh, spaces where I am often the only woman or the only African-American or the only whatever, mm -hmm. so that. So take me from the pastor acknowledging your call to preaching. I was in law school when I answered the call and um, I went to the board of examiners and they immediately told me that I needed to go to seminary. So I dropped out of law school to go to seminary. And uh, because I was a speech pathologist, I started working with a professor at I Love School of Theology, critiquing people's sermons from a speech pathology standpoint. And then, uh, and because I was singing, Reverend Boyd said, well, you know, you have to do this trial sermon thing. So um, 
when I did the trial sermon, the, my form is not everybody else's form. So it took them a while to understand what I was doing because I do do heavy, heavily rhetorical kinds of things. And um, I think I always preached, but it wasn't the traditional African-American definition of preaching. I wasn't in the big chair, but so I teach my students now, you don't have to be in the big chair to preach. It's the way you live out your life. It's when you minister, it's when you, when you testify, it's, 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 um, I went from, I didn't preach on Sundays, I would preach on Wednesday nights. And so then it got to the point after the second year and I was in seminary and working with the preaching professor, I didn't have a preaching class. I had one preaching class in my life. Mm. Uh, that was a two week class with Charles Adams and the next um, preaching black and white. And the next year I was his TA. And so when it came to go <laughs> for a preaching job because I was preaching in women's services and things like that in, in the AME church. Uh, um, I had a, a gospel group that toured the Southwest. And uh, so I was always asked to do little things before, you know, before I sang. And um, so when it came time to even start teaching preaching, um, I had done language workshops and delivery workshops around the South, Southwest part of the country. And the Dean at Candler called and said, I understand you do language workshops, delivery workshops. Would you be interested in a position? My degree is in ethics and social transformation. So I studied for two weeks and went to the interview and God gave me the job two weeks later. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got to preaching. Okay. So you talked about your preaching method and being, you know, heavy, heavy rhetorical. So talk to, talk to us about what is your preaching method and describe some of the rhetorical steps you take. When I was growing up, um, like I said, my first little speech and all these other kinds of things. I fell in love with the beauty of language because uh, I'm from the era where you had to memorize mm -hmm. poetry and memorize stories and do the creation, you know, and act it out and all these other kinds of things. And so there's something about the, 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 the use of language, sometimes vernacular and sometimes not, but the use of language to convince people of something, to convince people of a truth, to have them enter into a place in a text that you haven't heard before. And I've listened to sermons my entire life, but there's something about being able to, to immerse yourself in a text and then walk around and be bruised and, and lifted up and rejoice in the language that's in the text. And then how is it that from that, uh, I, I did an article on the birthing, birthing a sermon um, it's, it's how God will put a text in my head uh, when I'm watching people. Mm. When I'm uh, uh, watching commercials, it used to drive my husband crazy because in the middle of a commercial, I'd have a sermon idea. I can't go to the movies without writing things down. But it's taking in all of this stimuli and then thinking about how would God want me to use that language, those images, to pair that with a text to help people understand all the more what God wants, not what Teresa wants. My steps are, right now I'm thinking about the sermon I have to preach on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, I never stop thinking about sermons. I never stop thinking about texts. I never start thinking about how to talk about a text. It's always in my sleep, so I keep things next to the bed so I write down things. Uh, it's an ongoing process like I'm, uh, Prathia used to talk, Prathia Hall used to talk about if you don't deliver a sermon, you will be perpetually pregnant. Well, it's, it's like I'm always birthing new ideas, but it's then to take every part of me, every creative spark that I have and put it into um, a sentence. Uh, it's to play with language. Mm -hmm is to think about what the people, as, as Gardner Taylor would say, to put my, myself in the seat of the listener. Mm -hmm. It's to think about how is that five-year-old, what kind of language can I use with that five-year-old to help them love Jesus? Mm -hmm. it's, it's to think about how to work with a multiply handicapped child and, and how do I enter in effectively so that as Ola Moyd said, I can reach each ache. Mm -hmm. so, my, so my, I don't do the 50 hours I do every second mm. for the next sermon. Mm -hmm. Every second is for the next sermon. Um, every experience is for the next sermon. 
every tear is for the next sermon. Mm -hmm. um, every, uh, so I start the morning watching all the news because someplace in there is the next sermon. And that's part of my strategy. So it's not clean. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I dance the sermon. I'm a liturgical dancer, believe it or not, with all this, I liturgically dance, right? Uh, it's, it's in various types of music, but I just see, good, <laughs> I don't see demons, I see God everywhere. <laughs> so, so it's that kind of ongoing, uh, how do I convince, convert, persuade people with the language, not to come to me, but to come closer to God. I try to, uh, when I'm writing a sermon, I, th I think of with whom I'm preaching, the persons with whom I'm preaching. I'm thinking about the context in which I'm preaching. I'm thinking about the social milieu that I, that I believe that many of the people uh, exist in from time to time. I think about what impacts us all and try to find language to lift up different concerns all in one sermon so that we can pull people in at different times, but never losing the text. Mm -hmm. I think it's critical that we never lose the text. I, I, you know, from teaching, preaching, sometimes I can, I'll listen to a sermon and I keep thinking, okay, where's the text? Where's the text? Where's the text? The people need to know the text. If not, it's my opinion. Uh, so I can, I can lace or weave in contemporary kinds of things in an ancient text because I think that's what the ancient text did. Mm -hmm. uh, that I have to earth the sermon as best I can. And because again, I, I know I'm gonna keep saying language, but that's who I am. And, and because I want to use language that people can remember and repetition so people that can remember, but I also want persons who are listening to understand that God is in the center of everything in a text that may be thousands of years old, but the text is still very new, that, that God never leaves us. And so my intentionality is the ongoing presence of God in spite of. And, and that, that the, the words that we preach should break barriers, not build them up. Because I've also heard those castigating kind of sermons that other people the whole time. And so when I choose words, I could have said, uh, the current person in 1600 is an idiot, but that's pejorative language. So then I have to find other ways of saying it. So instead I would say, God did not die and say that whoever's at 1600 runs my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I also have to be careful that I'm not, even though I want to critique society because it's part of rhetoric, right? Critique society or, or as you talk about the social justice aspects of it, the cultural imperatives that all of those are present in this sermon because I want to find a space for everybody regardless of age and gender and sexual orientation and and political parties, I want them all to be able to find God in the sermon someplace. So they can reject part of it because that's abhorrent to them, but I want to have something in each sermon that everybody in the congregation at some point in time can connect with. And that is the word of God. And then the illustrations, just pull them in more. You said um, a minute ago that your style initially when you first started was very, they had to get used to your style and your style was very different than African-American, traditional African-American, mm -hmm. that's my word, African-American mm -hmm. preaching. Mm -hmm. So is that still true or reflect on your style versus the tradition? I, I think when I grew up, I, I heard a lot of three-point Puritan, Puritan form, right? Three points, story joke, uh, story joke hoop, hoop story joke, and uh, hoop, hoop, hoop. And, and, and I was really interested because I also had models of people that really interrogated the text, that loved the word, and I wanted to make sure that that was part of who I, that is part of who I am. That's who I was raised to, that the text is central to what's going on. And so there are a lot of people that had sound and people were going crazy for it, but I didn't find God anywhere in the sound. Uh, there was a lot of, 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 of um, in my perception, from my vantage point, it was a lot of performance, but there wasn't substance. And so it depends on where I was at that time. So understanding that this was in, I started preaching in 1982. So there were different forms going on then. And so then I waited for those people that, that were not afraid of intellectual discourse, mm -hmm. uh, that were uh, inclusive in their preaching um, 
that weren't demeaning women, <laughs> that weren't uh, asking only for resources. Um, so I guess it depends, when I say African American preaching at the time, it depends on who, with, who I was listening to at that time. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say this is a stereotypic African American preaching. Yeah. Uh, I was Baptist, I was AME, I would go to the Pentecostal church. So, so I went to all these different denominations. And so um, it was what was held up as the standard at that time. Mm -hmm. But I was very fortunate where I was that the people who came through Denver were Prathia Hall and Charles Adams and Frederick Sampson and, and a variety of other people that had very different styles than what I heard in many places. Yeah. And so I wanted my style to be distinctively mine and it, at times I've been rejected because it's distinctively mine. I've been told that it's too deep, that it's too heavy, that it, it doesn't have the hoop. Uh, and I said, I don't think you planned the hoop and it's supposed to be spirit. So I have to do what God says, but God's also in the still small voice. So that to me is my hoop. And so it was, it was understanding that I was called to be Teresa with my gifts and not called to be anybody else. So I didn't get in a club, I wasn't in a circuit, I was just doing me, so there's consequence for just doing you. So who, I think you mentioned several just a moment ago, but uh, give me some of your preaching heroes and sheroes. Okay, this is going to be hard because when people usually ask me this, I say, uh, for me, it's the people that put in the work, so they may not be known. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a list. There are people that I've listened to contemporarily. There are people that I grew up listening to. But for me, solid preachers are my heroes and my sheroes. The ones that do all the work of pastoring, but have a word that gives life on Sunday or Wednesday or Thursday. That works for me. And so uh, we're not the cheers. Everybody knows my name. It's the people that I can observe, that I can just sit. And they're just so distinctively them, but there's there's integrity in their preaching. There, there's, there's authenticity in their preaching. You can tell that they've been with God mm. and, and they don't have to have a lot of applause or tell people to say amen, it's just there. And that's, that to me, those are my heroes and those are my sheroes in preaching. And some of them are not ordained. Mm. My grandmother was the greatest preacher in the world, mm. okay? And it was in sitting down and talking to her and picking up witticisms and how to analyze people and how to be present with people in this all-encompassing, all in Haggy's children kind of thing that we love everybody in spite of who other people say they are. Mm -hmm. That to me is sermon. So I don't want to do the cliche-ish, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. It's just the people that I know um, love the Word of God love God's people and are grateful for the oh God <laughs> and are grateful for the opportunity to say something for God. That to me is what my preaching lodges on. I understand who I am. I understand where I've been. But every time I'm allowed the opportunity to preach, I get so nervous because this is God work for me. It is, it is God allowing God's word to reside in my head, in my heart, and then I'm allowed to share it with people who may or may not accept it, but it's still God work. And that to me is the essence of, of preaching. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. I always talk about sling and snot and here I go. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, the, it's the privilege of preaching because we understand that in the biblical text, you weren't even supposed to say God's name. And God takes earthen vessels that have all kinds of scars and histories. And God says, I want you to stand before the people and say, this is not play acting. This is, this is not so people can love you. You have a hard challenge, which is to take the history of what I've been with people is to take uh, what you know across the course of human history is to take those times when it doesn't seem like I'm there at all, is to take people throwing things at you, is to take people saying that you're all kinds of people. And still I want you, Teresa, to stand there and say something on my behalf. 
and to be responsible enough to stay till the end of the service. Don't run to your office, but stay to the end of the service. So if somebody disagrees with you, you can still discuss it and understand that they don't really love you. They love the God you're representing. Mm. That to me is the essence of what it means to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And that's me. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, yeah. I was blessed just to sit <laughs> with you to, to break that out. Thank you. If I were to ask you generally across all of the preaching students you've had, what would, as a conglomerate, what would they say are the three top teachings or lessons, lessons of Dr. Teresa Fry Brown? So the first day of class, my students preach for 30 seconds. Uh, they walk in, I give them a text, they preach. Some of them are not sure they're called to preach. Some of them are terrified. But I think it's important to start recognizing the voices within you. So one of the first things that my students, even the ones that tell me at the end, I hated you in class, but I'm always prepared to preach. I think that if you answer a call to something, you have to always be ready and not tell people, no, you know, I didn't have my 50 hours to exegete a text. The text should be living within you. So the first thing I tell them is to always be ready. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to be you, to do you, to preach as God has instructed you to preach, even with the pressures of cloning, hmm. even with the pressures of we can only invite you if you, fix, if you fit this stereotype, if you, if you dress a certain way, or if you're going to do this at the end, or if you're gonna sound, just do you because understand that God called you, society did not. Um, the third is textual integrity. Textual integrity. Don't make the text up. People know when you lie. <laughs> Don't make examples up. People know when you lie. Um, be honest with the people. Um, never manipulate the people, but be honest with the people. I think those are the three. Be ready, be authentically you, and have some integrity about what you're doing. Those are the three things. Um, if you had to talk to us about your most difficult preaching moment, mm. what, what would that be? Um, this is, it, it was my most difficult just because of the, the, the context. Um, you know, you, you're the one in the family who preaches and so you're called to do all the family stuff. So when my mom died, um, she was a member of a Baptist church in Kansas City. And um, my sister called and she said, Teresa, you understand that you're going to preach a eulogy, but it's a Baptist church. I said, okay. Um, when I got to the church, the pastor wasn't there, but all the, all the ministerial staff was there. And they said, we were here to keep you out of the pulpit. Mm. Uh, this was in 2000. Mm. Um, I preached my mother's eulogy at the foot of her casket on the floor of a church. Mm. And it was difficult because it was my mother, but also because I had to understand, again, what I've been teaching my students, that all ground is holy ground, so it didn't matter where I was standing. And when I finished, my grandmother said, you did what God wanted you to do. It doesn't matter where you stand, just preach. Mm. So my sermon, Just Preach, came out of that. Mm. that uh, my womanist sensibilities was, no, I need to be in the pulpit. My, my, this is my mom, how much you disrespect her wishes was there. But at the moment that it was time to do it, God said, just stand. And that was the most difficult. It wasn't when I, when I preached before 10,000 people, it wasn't when I'm preaching in Europe, it wasn't any of that stuff. It was all the emotions that came to pass. And so it was, okay, am I going to fight this fight now or I'm going to honor my mother? Mm. And it was honor my mother because I could live another day to fight, mm -hmm. right? And so even though when I started out, I remember uh, the content of some of my sermons were, you know, and it was almost an apologetic for being a woman who was preaching and God calls everybody. And then it's like God smacked me upside my head. That's really an academic kind of term, right? Mm -hmm. God, <laughs> and God said, I didn't ask you to say all that. I told you to go do this thing. Mm -hmm. 
And so it was understanding that if I let God do all the social political stuff about me preaching and I just preach wherever, then I've done what God tells me to do. So that was, that was, that was difficult. Um, so I, th I think that I can preach anywhere after that. Mm -hmm. And I can preach anything. It's never been about content because most people know I'm going to do that social justice thing. That's me. That's my passion. My preaching passion has to do with inclusivity and the beloved, the beloved community and world that I think is in the biblical text in places, because we understand in the biblical text there are some exclusion, but they're in places. But that's, that's my passion. That's what I'm called to do. So that doesn't even bother me anymore. I can talk about anything. Uh, I can go against church law and talk about something that I really think God wants. That's not hard. It was that moment and it was defining for me because I represented for my family who my mother was, who always told me I could do everything. I represented for my family someone they had put trust in. And my brother, <laughs> my brothers are ready to fight if I was going to fight, but why tear up something? So I'm gonna let, you know, I always tell people, uh, I don't have to argue about being a woman in ministry anymore. I'm gonna wait to the rapture and let God explain it to me. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, I'm right. I don't have to fight that battle. Mm -hmm. Go to the other side. And I know that, you know, as preachers, we all carry a, a measure of humility and you have a large measure of that. But give me a sense of, of a time that you thought you really said it well or you thought you really did what God wanted you to do and you could celebrate mm -hmm. uh, your gifts and God's grace. So give me, go to the other side and give me a time. Oh, um, <laughs> that I really thought I was doing well in a sermon? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never think that I'm doing well in a sermon. <laughs> uh, I think that's that Missouri stuff about always, you know, be humble, be a hum live a humble, right, right. live a humble Lord, live a humble, right? <laughs> um, I don't think I ever think that I do well. I don't think that I, I, I know that I do the best that I can. I don't ever have this sense of I hit it out of the ballpark. Uh, I, it's always what can I do better next time? And that's, that's just who I am. So, I mean, there have been some sermons I thought, oh, that was pretty good. And then I think, no, wait a minute. So I'm, I always tell my students that I'm, uh, you're often your own worst critic. Mm -hmm. And I am, mm -hmm. uh, because I always want to know what I can do to be better. Right. Uh, I missed this part. Last night, I'm at the hotel going, okay, Teresa Lynn, you know, you were supposed to do that, and you didn't do that, and then da da da, and you stuttered over this word. And, and so I, I replay these things, and it's almost like this obsession with me to try to be better, not to be perfect, but to try to be better. And so I cannot remember. Um, I preached in Chicago on Sunday and I don't even think I was there for the sermon. Um, not to sound spooky or anything, but I know that there are some times that I'm in this place um, where I can tell when Teresa has a seat and when it's all God. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are sermons where I don't even remember preaching the sermon. Mm -hmm. I have a manuscript. I don't remember what I've done, and when I sit down, I'm so spent, and people say, oh, that's a wonderful sermon. I thought, okay, I don't know. So it's very difficult for me to say that there is, there's a sermon that I thought it was really good. Um, there's some that when I write them, I think, oh, this is some good stuff. <laughs> but, but then when I get there, I start doing, I always pray for God to edit, uh, no matter what, where we were before I started preaching, my prayer is for God to edit and allow me to be submissive enough in the moment not to think I own the word. Mm. And, and so regardless of what people say in that, the perfunctory things in the line afterwards, you know, uh, I don't hear amens. Mm -hmm. I don't see people's faces. Mm. I, 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 after the first year when I was in a church where they would come up and hit you, and so I grew up with boys. <laughs> And so the first time I jumped, it was like, okay, fight or flight, right? <laughs> it's like, wait, am I supposed to hit somebody back? What is this? <laughs> and um, sometimes I don't, I, I, ser I seriously don't remember. And so I have to rely on 
preaching partners or it was it when my husband was living, my husband or my daughter, and they would give me a thumbs up and I would go, okay. But I'm still rehashing things and trying to figure out what I did that wasn't good. And so maybe it's a defeatist kind of thing, but I can't remember. I, do, I, I couldn't pick one out. Um, I did Hampton a few years ago and um, I was the lecturer in the morning and I wrote lectures. This is how I do language. It said, lecture. Mm. I wrote lectures. Mm. I got to Hampton and Bishop Bryant said, Doc, you have to preach. I said, Bishop Bryant, it says lecture. Mm -hmm. William Watley comes up and says, you have to prelect. I said, what in the world? I didn't say that, but what in the world is a prelect? And he said, you have to sound like a sermon. I said, no, a lecture is this, a sermon is this. And so then I had all these people telling me what I had to do. So I had to push together these things and I was amazed that they came together. Mm -hmm. So if I could think of a time that I was like, oh, that worked pretty well, it would be the prelex at Hampton. Well, I was there and you were, you were amazing. I, I, I was sitting right there. So, which leads to my next question. So what do you do with affirmation or when people call, walk up to you and say, oh, that was, that was just so awesome. That, that changed my life. It was just a blessing. So what, what do you do with that feedback? Uh, it's my Missouri upbringing again. I usually say, thank you or bless you. Pray for me. Because, okay, so there's a song in the Baptist church. <laughs> in when I was growing up that said, Lord, if I get too high, bring me down low, <laughs> right? If my head gets so big, right. I have to take a reservation to get in the house, knock me down. Right. So I don't want to be knocked down. So, I, so if I'm preaching as a conduit for God, then it's not me doing it. And so that's usually my response. And it's embarrassing to me. Mm. And, or if somebody says you really helped me, then I just grab them and hug them because I'm rejoicing that God allowed me to say something that's helped somebody else. Mm. So it's, um, or people say, Doc, you know you did that. And, and so I, you know I have difficulty with language. I have difficult with people saying you slayed it, you killed it. You, those are violent terms for me. And so I don't understand saying somebody tore up a house. That's violent. I grew up in it. My dad was violent. So those are abhorrent terms to me. Um, he was abusive. And so those, those are abhorrent terms to me. And so it's, to me, it's, um, I just can't get too excited about it uh, because people don't understand how nervous I am when it's time to preach. I get physically ill before a sermon. Um, I, I, uh, because I don't want to let God down when I preach. Mm -hmm. And so if I ever think that I let God down, it's devastating to me. And sometimes it takes me a week to recover. And so in like manner, if, if God is, if God has done something that people love, then that's God's stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just grateful to God that I even got through it because I'm an introvert <laughs> and I would be very happy to just be in a room someplace, just singing, you know, I don't want to do the little black mother hum kind of thing. Not that I just, I just, I, I, I come, I, I'm in front of people when I need to be. And then I go back and I reflect and help people, but it's just such a special moment for me. It doesn't, it doesn't really pump my ego up. Yeah. I am still amazed. I, 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 when I fly back and forth, I have window seats because I'm still amazed that God has asked this little black girl from Independence, Missouri to stand in front of thousands of people all over the world and say something for God. Um, so I sat by the window so I can look out and have conversations with God without all that stuff going on in airplanes. But whenever I get, uh, any invitation to me, whether it's five people or five million people is astounding to me. And that somebody thinks enough of the work God has done through me to say, could you come and preach for us is amazing to me after 35 years 
Uh, somebody said, you go a lot, Doc. I said, when people stop asking, then maybe I'll think about that's a problem. But it's, it's absolutely astounding that uh, I'm recognized for work that I do, that uh, you said I have a senior chair, and I, that was not in my plans. Uh, I was going to be an ethicist and run around and change the world. <laughs> and uh, that, that God, it's God's work. And I, I never want to take for granted that God did not have to call me to preach. So uh, what, what message would you give to young preachers? And if you would like, I want to divide it into particularly young female preachers and then young male preachers, because um, there are a lot of preachers who I think mm -hmm. would benefit from your wisdom, your experience, your depth, your language. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to young preachers, maybe female, maybe male? The advice I give to all of my preaching students is to do the work. To put in a, I, God deliver me from lazy preachers. Uh, read a book, read several books, read stuff that's not Jesus-y. Just, just, just soak up humanity, um, uh, understand people, spend some time with people, with a variety of people and do the work. Do not get up on Sunday morning and open your mouth and say, God gave me something and you know you've never opened a text. Don't, don't, don't do that. Um, um, and do the work well and grind in the work and evaluate the work and honor the work. That's what I say to all my students, regardless of gender and ethnicity and all those other kinds of labels we put on people. Uh, I think that we de the people deserve to hear a well crafted sermon, not, a, not, not lecture kind of thing, but a well, a living. To me, a sermon is not mechanical, it's organic. Mm -hmm. So people deserve that you, that you can show that you honor what you're doing enough to put the work in. That's all preachers. Um, I tell young women, you were called to preach. You weren't called as a woman to preach or as a man to preach, you were called to preach. Um, you do not have to prostitute yourself to preach. Uh, you are called to say something about God before the people. Um, try not to spend all your time with excuses about why something's not done. Um, do not copy anybody. Do not copy anybody. You can listen to people, and we understand that, that you listen to people and there may be this or that you like, but try not to try, do not set out trying to be Frank Thomas. Uh, because I think God was creative enough that God created each of us to be our individual with our individual gifts. So I don't have to be Frank Thomas to be a preacher. Um, fall in love with the text, even the, even the text of terror there's something even in the genealogies that give us life. So re to preach the entire Bible, not just your special text. Um, young preachers, do not ask anybody, do not run around, and this is happening, this is why I say this. Uh, and this came to, my, came to my head about, came to my attention about seven years ago where younger preachers, because they think old preachers that are pastoring will never die, and some of them won't. Um, we're running around telling people, you need to invite me to preach at your church. That they have this whole PR campaign that says, bring me, bring me, bring me, bring me, bring me. And, and so I tell them not to do that. That pastors use discernment about who to invite to do things. That God directs who's supposed to do things. So if, so if this becomes your business, it's not preaching. It's, it's, it's your corporation. It, it, it's people that cannot spell Bible that have a website that say, I'm a preacher. Uh, uh, irritate me to no end. Uh, that, that if you put in the work, God will place you where you need to be. Hmm. You don't have to have a campaign and a PR agency. Just do your work and people will find you. And it always, it, it, and preaching doesn't have to always be on a big stage, hmm. right? Because in American society, if you don't have a big stage, you're nobody. 
But when you ask me about the people that I respect, they're people that may be preaching to two people. I have students that preach in a four point charge where they have less than 30 people in each of those churches. They're putting the work in and they're doing what they need to do. And people may never know their names, but they're doing the work. And that's what I try to teach them. Because I have students that come into seminary and think, you know, Doc, when I leave, I'm going to have about 4,000 people. Where? where? <laughs> <laughs> you have a hit squad on somebody down the street. <laughs> you don't know what it takes to do to be a pastor and preach. Because all they see is that 15 to 35, 40 minutes, but they don't see what it really takes to do the rest of it. So I just say, wait, your turn. And it's not because I'm older that I say, wait your turn. But I think that, that there's too much preaching abuse going on with people thinking that preaching is about power and, and their presence, that God doesn't show up until they come in, mm -hmm. that God is not present until, like they don't go to the rest of the service, but they just show up and preach and leave. Mm -hmm. that, that, that preaching is worship. It's in the context of worship. So be there for everything. Instead of just showing up when it's your, you know, mm -hmm. Somebody, and here comes Teresa. No, <laughs> no, because the last time somebody was announced, I think they were on a cult coming into town and they got killed. <laughs> okay. okay, I digress. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I'm not crying. <laughs> so given all the accolades and the, the tremendous, tremendous symbol that you are to so many. Mm -hmm. um, how do you stay humble in the midst of all of that? Um, I, my devotional life is, I'm, I'm a, I sing, um, I'm a lyric soprano. And um, so I listen to all kinds of music, but I also try to understand people and the variety of emotions that people have. And I just love, I, this is gonna sound strange, I just love God. And I have, um, when I was uh, 23, I had cancer. And it came back when I was 38. And uh, I'm 66. God didn't have to leave me here any of those times. And so because God has allowed me to continue to do what I do in spite of what my body says I can't do, I just love God doing whatever God is doing. And so I think that, that um, this whole song, you didn't have to let me live. Uh, I'm glad to be in the service one more time. That's, that's me. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm just glad to be alive and, and uh, as everyone has, has the testimony that there are many people in their, in their age range that are no longer here or no longer able, as long as I can put one foot in front of the other with or without my pumps, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so with the rigorous demands of the bandy chair, your leadership in so many sp spaces, preaching, teaching, so how do you take care of yourself. Tell us about your self-care routine. Um, I, you know, they, there's this old thing about laughter is the best medicine. I try to take myself too seriously, but um, I sometimes, um, I was what was called a parentified child in that I had to raise my younger brother and sister because my mother worked two jobs and my dad had his own personal demons. And, and so I grew up as an, I, my childhood was adulthood. So every now and then I just, go out and do whatever with children. I, I take off sometimes, I did a few weeks ago, so just to go visit one of my relatives with no computers, no anything. I have what is called a F-U-N-K day, a funk day. I took my time because people say I cuss when I say that word, <laughs> where I do nothing. I unplug everything. Uh, I think that that was modeled by Jesus who when they were upset because Lazarus had died and Jesus took Jesus' time to get there. I, I send prayers. I don't always have to be present. <laughs> my prayers will go further than my presence. And um, this was deepened when I took care of my, um, uh, sometimes I have friends who just come by and say, T, we have to go. Uh, my husband used to just pack a bag and take me someplace. So sometimes I just take off. 
and, and I can, without the gaze of people that want me to do, um, I try to eat right. Uh, I had a trainer up until I was taking care of my husband as he was dying and I kind of stepped away for a while, but I was doing that for a while also. Um, I read widely. I love to go to movies. Um, I love good music, concerts, things of that nature, but something that, that releases me from the pressure of being um, the bandy chair, uh, from being the um, historiographer of the AME Church that relieves me from always counseling and taking care of people, uh, and just being Teresa Lynn, um, and talking. I have, I have a, a group of people who have known me for years that I can call them at any time at all, and if I'm feeling pressure or toward a ledge, they can, we just start laughing about stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the humor of life that keeps me in a place of self-care. And I try not to, as I said, I'm excited because I'm still alive. Even when there's doom around, which is what I was trying to preach you last night, uh, it's reminding myself that uh, none of us are in charge of anything. So I can be a control freak when I'm doing bandy stuff because I know as a black woman, because I'm in this chair, everybody's looking. Um, I know that at the church, because I'm the woman that's the general officer, everybody's looking. And so I just pull back sometimes and just decide this is not the day I'm doing that. This is the day that I'm not doing my hair, I'm not doing makeup, I'm wearing flats, I'm gonna go play. Now there are some places I play I will never tell anybody about. <laughs> <laughs> But Las Vegas is in the title. <laughs> and uh, so I just, I just do that. I hang out with friends, and usually friends that are not ministers. Because it helps me if I'm not around preachers all the time. Because I think that can kill your spirit, being around preachers all the time. Nothing against preachers, but you can die being around preachers because all we talk about is preacher stuff. And I have children um, that I call my children that, that uh, I cook. I love to cook. Uh, I design things, and so we, I can just be me without all that professional weight. And I'm also, this is the last thing, I'm very careful about who I invite into my house. Um, I don't invite negative people into my house. Um, and if somebody comes in and they turn negative, they don't have another invitation. Because my home is a sanctuary to be an individual who loves life and... Um, wants other people to be comfortable. And so that to me is a big relief. So I, don't, I just don't invite that into my space. Mm -hmm. I also listen to a lot of jazz and R&B. I have a big listening room in my basement. And so sometimes I just go down and scream at the top of my lungs and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. As a scholar of homiletics, what, do, what would you hope even PhD students, mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you hope the next generation of scholars and homiletics would accomplish? Okay, so since I work with, with students who are the next generation, um, I say this in the academy and also the church. I, th I think that knowing the foundations but not being controlled by them of homiletical theory, of rhetorical, uh, discourse is important, but always build on that. Find better ways of doing it. Find new ways of preaching. Find uh, a more inclusive form of preaching. Um, a better delivery of preaching. Um, uh, different vehicles for preaching. So I, I, if you look across, well, you're studying history right now, but there's always been some improvement, but, the, but you still see this core from, from Kristensoff and everyone from the beginning of rhetoric that you always see that that's the foundation and then all these other kinds of things have built on top of it. And so for this next, for the next generation, not because I'm going off the scene, but preserve the voices of the people who came before you, understand the theories that were before you, but make new theories. 
always make new theories. Uh, improve on what was there. Don't throw it away. Just this is now this is something we do in addition to it. That's how I think that scholarship is built, not by tearing away what was there before, but critiquing it. And critiquing it, not just to dismantle it, but to say, oh, but you missed this, or let's add this into it. And then I think that even though we, I mean, we've lived through the preaching is dead era, we've, we've lived through the, you only have to do it this time era, we've lived through the school of, of this is, uh, we lived through the Mitchell School and the Buttrick School and all those things, but also to teach people how to be individually them. And, and, and leave something for the next group. So when I talk to my students and they bring in a new theory, I'll say, I wonder how that's going to work, but it's not my job to determine that. It's up to the next generation to determine that. I wouldn't want anyone to say that my, uh, because I started walking, uh, was the first one to write about womanist homiletics, doesn't mean I don't want somebody else to do it because they may see something else. Uh, so it's, it's foundational information and then building upon it. Um, and bringing always, never being afraid of new ideas about how to do this thing called preaching. So you talked about your preparation for preaching. Um, so how do you prepare for preparation for writing and your inspiration and scholarship in writing? Um, I read as much about homiletics as I possibly can contain. My library will show you that. But I always look for what's not there. Uh, my dissertation I wrote because I was a single mom at that time and, and out in society and, and sociologists were saying that single black mothers, children will wind up on the street or dead. So I'm inspired by, <laughs> this is my whole life, I'm inspired by what's missing and I'm inspired by what people say can't be done. And then I start writing about that, mainly about what's missing, whose voice is not present. Uh, and so I'm always, like I said, I'm always writing sermons. I always have these ideas. I have. Um, a book that I'll just set sometime and write about, I need to do this, I need to do this, and then pull it back together. So the book I'm working on now is Wearing Your Own Pumps. Uh, and, it's, and it's about um, the individuality and authenticity of each woman's voice that preaches. Mm. Um, so so it's, it's, when I wrote can a sister get a little help? It was because I was asked to, so sometimes people ask me to write things. I was asked to write something about my journey in ministry to help because the publisher was getting inquiries about is there a book for women? But I had to do it in my way. So it's, it's a scenario and then a list of, of things. And so it depends on if it's something that, that's generating in me or someone comes and asks me to write something. Uh, delivering the sermon was because people knew I had a background in speech pathology and they wanted me to write that. Uh, my preparation is, again, I just sit around and start writing notes. Mm -hmm. And so my articles are just things that I see are not there. And I have all these questions about life. Uh, my grandmother said I've been asking questions since I was able to talk. And I just start trying to answer the questions. Um, and then when it's time to write, I usually write about 18 hours a day. Mm. Yeah, I have to write. When I'm writing sermons, I can write for about 15 hours a day straight. Wow. And then I, and I, forget, to, I forget to eat, I forget to do, I, I just get really intent on what's going on. And when I'm writing a book, I can, do, I can do all the preparatory things and lay everything out. But when it's time to write, I can usually finish it within a month if I just sit down and I let nothing else in my way. So I have a room at home that has all my books and everything away from people's gaze and I just write intently and um, it just flows after that. So when I'm writing sermons, as long as you're not talking to me, I can write the sermon. Um, and then there are other times for sermons particularly that I just, in the moment it comes and then I start writing. But if I'm writing a book, I just have to do all my preliminary stuff and then just sit down and write from the beginning to the end. Mm, wow, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Last question, um, so what are your thoughts about this brand new PhD program in African-American preaching? From the time we first started talking about this, mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was a fabulous idea because I'm very clear uh, that um, there is both, there has been both a disrespect 
and deferential treatment of the genre that is African-American preaching in the academy. There has also been rampant borrowing without any citation <laughs> of the genre. And uh, dare I say a bastardization of black preaching. And so when you started talking about this and we had the, the coming together people that teach preaching three years ago, right? Three years ago, I was excited about it because there's so many brilliant minds, African-American scholars and pastors and preachers that, that my thing is for us to write. Mm -hmm. I always say to preachers and blacks, you have to write. You, the African saying that says, until, until the lion has a pen, the hunter always wins. Mm. And so this coming together of this program means that those that have been hunted are now writing <laughs> and letting the world know, we've been here all along, you've ignored us. Uh, we, we have interrogated text, and now we're going to put that together. We're, we're, we want to leave a memory of, uh, 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 um, a tangible memory of persons who have gone before, stylistic ways, hermeneutics, whatever, rhetoric. This is who we are. And I think it contributes uh, not just to black church studies, but to the cultural imperatives of African Americans mm -hmm. since 1442. Wow. Okay. And so that's why I'm excited about the program. I'm excited about the cohort and all the cohorts to come. And um, it also, because they're writing and it will be copyrighted when it's published, it may cut down on the borrowing. <laughs> that was very non-pejorative. Thank, <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for your time. This has just been above every expectation that I had. And I want to uh, let you know that we appreciate you. We love you. And um, you're going to bless many people. And um, may God give you rest and peace and joy for all the things in life that you love to do. Thank you, you. You are a great mentor, friend, sister to us all. So Thank you. God bless you. It's my brother. <laughs> Thank you.